Okay, in the next chapter, we will talk about statistical inverse problems. And our main example for that will be emission tomography. And um, since this uh, lecture is also about uh, medical imaging, I will get, explain in a little bit more detail what uh, emission tomography is, what it's used for, and uh, in fact, this is these um, are devices which are available in every major hospital and, for example, in Münster as well. Okay, uh, for the setting, we are again talking about radioactivity. So uh, uh, we have nuclear decay. And this time we'll look a little bit more into the physics of the problem. Instead of uh, comparing it with the computerized tomography, the big difference is that in CT we had radioactive sort out, a source outside of the body. In emission tomography, the radioactive, the radioactive, so, uh, radioactive source is inside the body. And uh, the idea is that we inject a radioactive substance, which is called the tracer, into the body and try to find out where it goes. That idea goes back uh, to uh, an ingenious idea, I think, uh, by uh, Georg von Hevesi, who was a Hungarian-German chemist. And uh, he was an interesting man. You might want to look him up. And uh, in 1923, he proposed a very simple experiment, which proved very successful. What he did was he fed a plant with, which was just just a bean, just I think just an ordinary bean, with radioactive lead. Then he waited six hours until uh, the lead just distributed inside the plant. And uh, then he measured the amount of radioactivity that was in every part of the plant. So that gave him an idea how substances that the plant takes up are distributed in the plant afterwards. So he could actually follow the lead go up in the plant and uh, he could trace, in a way, trace the lead uh, in the plant going up and down or going up. Okay, uh, of course, you had to uh, measure the distribution of the, uh, of the lead uh, by ripping the plant apart and then putting it into uh, a scintigraph or a spectroscope. But he could have done that also with a Geiger counter just from the outside without destroying the plant. So uh, that's an interesting idea. You can find out the distribution of something uh, by making measurements from the outside if that something is radioactive. And that's exactly the idea behind emission tomography. So, um, I mean, we have CT, so why could something else be interesting? Why could it be attractive? Uh, first of all, in X-rays uh, and in CTs as well, what we see is morphology. So we see how something looks. But uh, the problem is uh, that uh, if a, a part, maybe a part of the heart is already dead, you won't see it because it doesn't immediately change. So uh, sometimes we would like to see function. Is something still working or is it already dead? Is it, um, is it not functioning properly? So uh, that's one thing. We would like to see what parts of the body are still alive. And that's important for the heart and for the brain, of course. And the second thing is uh, we would like to identify small tumors uh, which often look in a city like the surrounding and are not very obvious, not very easy to find. Okay, one simple idea, could not a simple one. Um, one idea could be the following. We feed, like the plant, we feed the patient with a radioactive agent, sugar, uh, and... Uh, it's not fed, it's injected, I should say. Um, we wait for some time, and uh, then that sugar will be distributed all over the body. And of course, it will go where it is needed. So uh, it will only go to living parts. So if there's maybe some part of the brain that's already dead, it won't take up any sugar, and there will be no radioactivity there. 
On the other hand, tumors, for example, need a high lot need a lot of sugar. So if we can find out the distribution of the radioactivity inside the body, then we can also detect show detect uh, the tumors because that's a place where a high a load of radioactivity is and where there should be none. So we have radioactive markers that show us where tumors inside the body are. And uh, just as a side note, uh, this is also called functional tomography and uh, it shows us the metabolism of the body. Okay, um, what's the problem with that? Well, um, the problem is we can only use low dose to, uh, radioactivity because we, we feed it into the body. So uh, we won't, don't want to have high doses there. Um, so uh, we'll somehow have to change our physical uh, modeling. And uh, for CT, we assumed that there was a constant flow of energy along one single ray. Um, and uh, that will no longer be true for uh, emission tomography. And uh, we'll have to look at the particles that are emitted inside the body. Okay, so uh, I think it's quite clear now from this description what we really want. We want to find the distribution f of x of the tracer, radioactive sugar, inside the body. And by somehow measuring the radioactivity outside of the body, because we don't want to rip the body apart. Okay, the idea behind that is uh, that the radioactivity is somehow proportional to the number of particles emitted in some point. So f of x should be um, proportional to the number of par particles emitted in x. But uh, the problem is that number is always an integer number. And in a way, it's a random variable, right? Because uh, um, in, in emission, um, the emission of a particle is a random process. And probably we'll, have, we'll somehow have to take that into account. Note that this is completely different from what we viewed as noise in computerized tomography. There, that was due to some inefficiency of the device. And uh, if we could measure uh, better, if we could measure more exact, then uh, there would be no noise at all. This is not noise what we're having here, but it's something that's inherent in the modeling. And uh, that's the reason why we have to take that into account in this place. Okay, uh, there are three devices that I want to present to you. One of them is completely not interesting, but we'll use it for the second one. And uh, the first one is the gamma camera, or what is called scintigraphy. More or less, that's just a device that measures radioactivity um, uh, on, on a body. So you have you can think of this as uh, well, you have a, a photo here on the on the right. Maybe I should point at that. Yeah. So uh, this is an image of a gamma camera. So this is a two-dimensional device that is over the body. And uh, there are detectors, n-squared detectors of, for radioactivity inside that device on a plane. OK, uh, let's take a 2D section here. Uh, then it looks something like this. And now assume that uh, these, um, these sensors only measure radioactivity, so they somehow measure the number of photons or the number of um, uh, the number of photons that they are hit by. Then the problem is that if I measure a photon over here, let's say at this detector, at this uh, at this green detector over here, then I have no idea where that actually comes from. So it could be from this part of the body, it could also be from this part of the body. And uh, so just measuring uh, the number of photons here more or less makes no sense. I mean, of course, we somehow want to get back to line integrals so we can reuse our CT ideas, but uh, this has nothing to do uh, with, uh, with lines. So although the photons may be traveling on lines, um, we don't know where they come from, and so that's no use. Okay, so uh, that doesn't work. So we have to do something else. And that's the reason why that thing over here is so massive. You might ask, okay, the detectors are over here, but what is down here? 
And the thing is, there are pipes down there, pipes of lead that catch the photons. And uh, so the, uh, the thing looks more or less like this one over here. So here are the detectors again, but there are pipes below there which catch photons when they touch them. So let's assume that several photons are emitted from this point over here, then just going straight up, it will just pass the pipe and it will get to the detector. But if we have something that's not going straight up, like this one over here, it will, at some, it will hit that pipe over here, will be caught there, and uh, it will not be measured. It will never reach the detector up here. Same for this one. It will not go through. It will hit the wall of the pipe and will just be caught. Okay, so uh, if we have these pipes there, then only straight up photons will actually get through and all the ones that are oblique will all be caught. Okay, the problem with that, of course, is that now probably 99% of the radioactivity is completely wasted, right? So it's emitted by the body, it's somewhere in the body, it can damage the body, but it's not at all used. But there's no alternative. I mean, uh, with the upper measurement device, we couldn't do anything. Okay, so uh, now we're somehow in the game because uh, uh, now we are measuring only the photons that go straight up. So we are measuring along lines for one single detector, for one specific detector, we are measuring radioactivity, we're measuring photons that were detected directly under that detector. So somehow we're measuring the sum of all photons emitted straight up on the line L under the detector. Okay, so uh, the mathematical model would, uh, of that would be, well, uh, assuming that uh, this, um, uh, the number of detectors is, is somehow proportional to the, uh, to the radioactivity on that line, we have that uh, the integral over L f of x dx is proportional to the number of photons that were actually measured. And again, of course, keep in mind that uh, proportional is like this. Uh, we have ran we still have a random variable. Okay, um, unfortunately, that is not completely true because uh, we are now neglecting the attenuation which we use to uh, to produce um, um, an image in the CT case. So we'll have to take that into account. And uh, of course, it's still there. So assume mu of x is the attenuation that we already know from computerized tomography. We already did uh, the modeling for that. And we know that uh, with a certain probability, um, an, um, a particle will not make it up to the detector, but will somehow be stopped, will get lost somewhere on the way. Okay, and the probability according to the CT case that we already looked at is something like e to the minus integral from where the point, where the um, um, particle was emitted, that's an x, up to the detector mu of y dy. Okay, um, so. Um, this is not comp not really the radon transform. This is because this is not a full line over here. This is uh, x is somewhere. If x was outside of the body, then this would be exactly the radon transform as we looked at it. But now x is in the center of the body, and so this is only part of the radon transform, right? Okay. So um, what we actually measure is the integral over l f of x dx. That's okay. But with a certain probability, this, these emitted um, uh, photons will get lost and uh, will only with a certain pr probability they will survive. And the survival rate is just e to the minus integral x to d mu of y dy. And it's exactly the same as in the, uh, uh, as in the modeling of the radon transform. Okay, this over here we call the attenuated radon transform. And uh, just to have at least one definition here, uh, let me write it down. Let's assume that f and mu are sufficiently nice. And uh, let's say they're in S of R2 or they're in C naught infinity and uh, C naught infinity, something like that. 
then uh, the one side x ray transform is defined as exactly what I have over here. So d mu of x and theta is the integral over from zero to infinity mu of x plus t times theta dt. So it's the radon transform that does not start at minus, it's the x ray transform that does not start at minus infinity over here, but it starts at zero. So uh, we are doing the attenuation only from the point where the photon was actually emitted. Okay, then uh, we can write the attenuated radon transform, which I already had up there, as the uh, as r mu f of theta and s is the integral over the line that's defined by theta and s. So it's the integral of x times theta is s, e to the minus d mu of x and theta perp, f of x dx. Um, where um, d mu is now the one-sided uh, x-ray transform. Note that uh, in here I define this only for R2, for simplicity, um, but also note uh, you saw that the detectors were actually 3D. So um, you might have the idea, okay, there we should actually be doing this in R3. And in fact, uh, usually all emission tomography problems are handled in 3D. But for simplicity, we'll keep everything to 2D. Okay, uh, I have the theta perp up here. And uh, this time I must say what I really mean by theta perp. Um, um, and I mean by theta perp, the rotation of theta by pi over two. So if theta is cosine phi sine phi, then theta perp is minus sine phi cosine phi, and that's the same as I already defined several times. Now, why do I have to do that? Because now a strange thing happens. Uh, for the uh, ordinary radon transform, we had that RF of theta and S is the same as RF of minus theta and minus S. Now, if I plug this in over here, this definition, this would be an integral of x times theta is s, and that's just the definition of the attenuated radon transform. What changes for minus theta and minus s? Well, uh, we now have minus x times theta is minus s, the minus cancels, and I can just plug this in over here. And then we have the same thing as above, with one exception, uh, because now if I rotate minus theta, by uh, 45 degrees, or by, by, excuse me, by 90 degrees or by pi over two, then this now becomes minus theta perp. And uh, I get the integral, same integral as above, but uh, with a minus sign over here. So these are no longer the same. And um, why that is can be easily seen. Um, assume that this is the body over here. Assume that this is the body. And at this point over here, uh, and particle, let's say two particles are emitted, one is going up and one is one is traveling up and one is traveling down. Then the one traveling up will have to go through almost all of the body. So it will be attenuated by the upper half of the body. And this one over here will be attenuated by the lower part of the body where lower is dependent on the, so on, on the position of the source. So these are now different and it really makes sense to measure 360 degrees uh, of the, um, to measure in 360 degrees rather than in 180 degrees like we did in uh, for the computer tomography problem. Okay, uh, now what you see is uh, it gives an image what we have here in just even just going um, even just measuring from uh, from the upper side. This gives an image. It's somehow equivalent to an X-ray. It has a slightly different mathematical modeling, but it suffers from the same problems. We still have integrals here, and um, it measures uh, for this uh, fixed position, it measures just r mu f of theta zero and s with theta zero horizontal but uh, we still cannot identify single points exactly as in the X-ray case. And for us, of course, the main problem is this is, you're just getting an image, right? So this is no inverse problem and we don't like that. Okay, uh, to make the problem a little bit more mathematically interesting, uh, SPECT or Single Photon Emission Commission to Computerized Tomography was uh, invented and, um, now, 
the goal is exactly the same as before. We don't want to see an, an X-ray that only gives accumulated information, but we want to be able to pinpoint single, uh, single places and we want to somehow cut open the body and look inside and uh, exactly pinpoint where the radioactivity is. Okay, uh, so uh, we'll do all the mathematical modeling in uh, 2D. And uh, of course, I mean, you, you saw what we did in CT, what would be the simple idea of um, getting the problem from number one to, uh, to a CT problem. Well, we we'll just move the measurement device around the, uh, the body, and this is exactly what happens. You see these massive things over here. These are the measuring devices. You immediately see it's measured from above and below, and that now makes sense because these are no longer the same. Um, and uh, of course, they are rotatable. See that as well. And uh, again, like in the CT case, we'll only take one slice. So uh, we'll assume we want to somehow find the distribution of radioactivity in one plane. Okay, um, one thing I should point at, uh, you see in the background over here, there is a, uh, something that looks very much like a CT device, and it actually is. Very often these are combined uh, with, uh, with a spec device, so you suffer from actually from double the uh, radioactive exposure. You have the spec tracer, and uh, so the, you have the spect tracer, so the radioactive tracer inside the body, and you're getting an additional computerized CT over here. So uh, this is not something you would like, but um, the thing is, why, why do we have to do that? Well, the problem is that uh, the mu from the, that we can only derive using the computerized tomography is somehow in that transform. And to fully understand what we get out here, we'll have to compute mu as well. And that's exactly what is done here, where the mu is computed using uh, the computerized tomograph. Then we have the, uh, and, and then we uh, can, we have a better idea what the attenuated radon transform is. And uh, then that's used for inverting that. Okay, uh, now uh, making, Take, rotating everything around, uh, we see that R mu F is measured uh, for some fixed posi positions of the measuring device, uh, which um, correspond to directions theta k. And we have parallel geometry as we had before, but this time it's real. Um, it's for, and it's measured for, for, some, uh, um, for some sensors located at SL. At SL. And uh, so uh, we're measuring R mu F on a parallel geometry exactly as, uh, as in the radon case, only we don't have radon, but uh, we have the attenuated radon transform. Okay, so uh, what's the problem with that? Well, uh, now we have the attenuated transform. And even if mu is known, it turns out that this is not so easy to invert. There is an analytic inversion formula, but um, it's very doubtful. No, no, it's very doubtful. It's very hard to implement. Uh, and um, it's not something that's really used. So we'll somehow have to go to discrete methods right from the beginning. And uh, the next problem is this is in fact a statistical problem and we'll somehow have to take the statistics of the decay and the statistics of the measurements into account. And uh, not the least important problem, a lot of radioactivity is actually wasted and um, just goes into the pipes, into the collimators. And uh, that means we'll have to use far too much radioactivity to get our, our tomogram. Okay, so uh, all, most, most of these uh, or some of these um, disadvantages are remedied by position, positron emission uh, computerized tomography. And uh, again, I will uh, just look at the 2D problem. And this time, uh, the only difference actually, or the, the main difference is that we now use a different isotope. 
So uh, well, fluorine 18 is uh, usually used in this case. And the thing is that it doesn't directly emit photons, but what it um, emits are positrons. And um, these positrons, when they leave uh, the, the uh, when they're emitted, they immediately dissolve into two photons, which decay into different, uh, into opposite directions. So the black one over here is the body. The green one over here is the place where the, um, where um, a particle is emitted and it immediately decays into two photons which are sent out in opposite directions. Okay, um, now there is a ring of detectors around the body and note that there are no collimators at all in this case. So um, at some point, assuming that uh, the decay happens in 2D, which it doesn't, and so that's something that should be dealt with in 3D, but I'll neglect it here. Uh, if everything is, um, is uh, sent out in the plane, then at some point, this will reach the ring of detectors. And uh, the, both photons will be detected at the, this at a detector D1 and a detector D2. And um, since they both travel at the speed of light, um, they will appear, they will be measured more or less at, the same, at exactly the same time at D1 and D2. There is a very, very small difference, of course, uh, because, um, well, it could be that this path is um, smaller than this one path. But uh, remember, they are traveling more or less at the speed of light. So the measurements will more or less occur at the same time. And uh, they, um, I'm going to forget about this. So I'm, I'll assume they, they are measured at the same time. But uh, in fact, just as a side note, uh, there is a small time difference and uh, this time difference can be measured and it gives us an additional information about where actually the photon was emitted if it was closer to D1 or closer to D2. But I'll forget about this at this point. Okay, um, so uh, the two photons are measured at the same time. So we know that whenever we have um, a photon, uh, if we have two, um, um, two uh, um, photons measured at the same time, then they must have come from uh, the same decay. And of course, that decay must have taken place somewhere on the line between D1 and D2. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, there's no need for collimators. And uh, all that means that everything in the plane is actually measured. So we'll uh, assume that PET is probably much more efficient than SPECT. And by the way, it's much more expensive. Uh, these devices are usually available in larger hospitals and uh, specific um, nuclear medicine um, practices. I don't know, doctors. And um, this is one of these, this is how typically these devices look like. So uh, I didn't find a bigger one, but this one is from Münster. So um, this is actually what the thing, what one of the devices in the university hospital looks like. And uh, if you look closely, it looks more or less like a CT device, only there's nothing rotating inside, but uh, it's just a ring, a fixed ring of detectors. And, um, but it's also very often combined either with computerized tomography or MR. And uh, that's of course, again, to measure the mu or the, uh, to measure the mu from the attenuated radon transform. Where MR of course is uh, magnetic resonance tomography, I, would, I should say. Okay, um, so uh, what does that boil down to? And we'll see that the mathematical modeling is a little bit simpler in this case. 
Again, our, the simple idea would be, well, the number of measurements on one line, uh, so uh, the number of uh, incidents we measure on one line, should somehow be proportional to the integral, to the radioactivity on that line. So we should have that the integral over L, f of x dx, should be uh, is the same as the number of decays measured on that line. Okay, uh, but uh, the problem, as we saw before, is that we are not taking um, attenuation into account in this case. So uh, let's do that now. So what is the probability that one, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, um, <laughs> that uh, the decay is actually registered on D1 and D2. Well, we need to have that this particle that's sent in direction D1 gets measured and the, uh, direct, and the one that goes in direction D2 gets measured. So uh, uh, the probability of reaching, of, of being measured is the probability of reaching D1 times the probability of reaching D2. If these are independent, then we have that uh, the, uh, the probability that both are reached uh, is just given by the product of the two. So uh, now our model for the number of measurements is something like, okay, we should have the, uh, the integral over the line. So that should be x times theta is s, f of x dx. But we need to take into account the probabilities. So uh, that's the, the damping, the attenuation of the first photon, which would be e to the minus integral of 0 to infinity mu of x plus t times theta dt times e to the minus integral 0 to infinity x minus t times theta perp, uh, theta perp dt. That would be theta perp as well. Okay, uh, but um, because one is traveling in direction theta perp and one is traveling in direction minus theta perp. But now we see, uh, well, the thing is that x is, um, on, uh, is on the line that is being measured, of course. And uh, the, um, this over here boils down to the integral over r mu of x plus t times theta perp dt. Well, just, just taking these two together. Okay, um, so, but uh, if x is on the line as well, then this is always the integral of a line, over the whole line mu of x. Uh, um, <laughs> mu of x, uh, mu of t times theta per dt, right? If, if x is on the line, then this is always the integral over, uh, minus the integral over r mu of uh, t times theta per, theta per dt, because this is always just a line over here. That's not correct. I should say s times theta over here. I'm sorry, because this is just, this is always the integral over the line, and the whole line is defined by s times theta plus t times theta per dt. Okay, um, so uh, this is independent of x, what is over here, right? So I can just pull it out, and I have this factor over here times x times theta is s f of x dx. Now assume that mu has been measured using a CP device. Then this factor over here can actually be computed and somehow it's some factor m of theta and s. Okay, so uh, dividing this, uh, we have that the integral over x times theta is s f of x dx, that this one over here, is proportional to 1 over m of theta and s times the number of measurements. Okay, so um, the radon transform without attenuation is now proportional to something we can actually compute. So the correct model for the PET problem, other than for the SPECT problem, is just the radon transform. And that's very nice. So uh, we'll stick with that from now on. So uh, now we are looking at PET, which we saw is um, nicely modeled by the radon transform. And the only difference to CT, which was also mod modeled by the radon transform with exactly the same geometry, everything is exactly the same, only the only difference is that this time we have something like a statistical model. And the question is, how can we take that into account? And uh, we'll start now by modeling one single 